there's this little documentary out that I haven't watched just yet by this uh, YouTube account called Ghost Gum. And it features our boy, Bert Crystals. Bint Krishnas is now the flipping target of a YouTuber. You know, YouTubers make flipping decent documentaries. So I'm sure this, this, this documentary is going to be absolutely amazing. I can't wait to check it out. It's called Lies and Alcohol. Well, that's the thumbnail, but that's the title is called The Biggest Liar in Comedy featuring Bert Kreischer. Let's check it out. Courtesy of the YouTube account called Ghost Gum. I've not checked out this channel before. I don't know what they're about. Oh, no, I did. Oh, they did. Oh, shit. I watched this, didn't I? I didn't remember that one. That's them. Okay, cool. He made a video on Brendan on Brendan Shaw called Reddit's Most Hated Comedian. And now he's got another one um, talking about flipping uh, Burt Kreischer. It's already on 34,000 views in two hours. God almighty. So it's going to it's gonna definitely run up the numbers. So let's check it out. This is the video. The story of somebody's audience turning on them seems to never get old, especially when people find the turn to be well-deserved. You have huge turns when somebody does something really bad, but more interesting ones tend to be the slow, gradual shift. And one of the best ongoing examples of that is once beloved comedian, Bert Kreischer. Bert is a case study on how to slowly lose your audience through your own misgivings with a little help from social media. Constant lying, insincerity, and just generally being stale and annoying have left people sour about Bert. But his but the thing that's the thing about Bert. Honestly, I don't want to stop it too early. The Bert thing's hard to really kind of like figure out because worst trait. Oh, oh, sorry, oh, Bert thing's hard to figure out because he has a lot of fans. Like, Bert isn't like Brendan. Bert doesn't, like, lie about ticket sales. He doesn't lie about selling out. He doesn't, like, you know, he, like, he legitimately is a big-time comedian. He has, like, free specials or maybe more on Netflix. He sells out shows all the time. He does fucking arenas. Um, you know, he does flipping car lots and shit. People buying tickets to go and watch him on a screen in their fucking car. He legitimately is big time. He's actually Netflix. He's not a blog buzzer. He's actually Netflix. Like, he's up there with those big comedians. I think even Tim Dillon was saying that in terms of ticket sales, I think maybe they were trolling, but he's actually really, really big. Like, he's in the kind of, like, you know, um, Sebastian, um, you know, kind of tier, uh, Joy Coy tier, fluffy tier of comedians. So the hate and people turning against him can be somewhat, he can probably cope a lot easier with it because his ticket sales and the actual fans that come out for him are crazy. Even just his meet and greets, like people form lines at his meet and greets, like actual long lines to see him and get a picture, maybe have a shot with him or something or rub his belly. So I don't think he's actually losing fans as many people think he is personally. I think he's actually getting even more famous than ever. And once this movie comes out, he might even become more famous than he actually is. So I'm not too sure I kind of agree with this narrative. Seems to be his inflated ego. Bert went from the drunk idiot, who's still a lovable persona, even if he's a bit stupid, to the LA comedian who is better than you, contributes more to society than you, and is a full-blown alcoholic. Although maybe this might have been deep-rooted and we all saw it coming. This is Bert Kreischer. Born in St. Petersburg, Florida, near Tampa, he first came to the public eye when attending Florida State University in his sixth year. Yes, sixth Whoa. year, which was at the time considered the number one party school in America, according to the Princeton Review. Rolling Stone picked up on this, and after discovering Bert, named him the number one partier. Holy shit, that's how he look like. Rolling Stone picked up on this, and after discovering Bert. Fuck you, now. He's never looked that great, is he? Like, you know, facially and shit. But I like the flipping earrings. Um, but yeah, he looks like he looks a little bit like a seal, doesn't he? Like a weird seal. And honestly, wearing a tie with a denim shirt, wearing a tie with a chambray shirt is fucking demonic. That's demonic. And having that little under that little underlip beard thing with no moustache or no goatee is also very very demonic, in my opinion. That's the most demonic look I've seen in my entire life. Like a denim shirt with a tie. Like, what's going on here? 
discovering Bert, named him the number one partier in the number one party school in America, which is basically the valedictorian for frat guys. And this is where his name would skyrocket. See, Bert was already doing a bit of stand-up comedy here and there, but he would parlay this notoriety into big venues for stand-up comedy, acting, and even filmmaking, usually supplemented with his heavy drinking and lack of a shirt. After making connections through comedy and name value, Bert was doing stand-up at big venues. While not witty or capable of really writing a punchline, he was a good storyteller. Thus, he became very well known for his drunken, goofy antics. He even got signed to Will Smith's management company, all while still being the drunken frat bro who somehow had a story for everything, which just so happens to be better and cooler than your story. We call this a one-upper. He's the quintessential Mr. Me Too. You could tell him you had a dog growing up and he'd tell you he had two dogs that were both sled dogs who found lost children on their spare time. It doesn't matter if the story's true as long as it's better than the other person's. Despite this, Bert was pretty innocent at the time. Sure, he wouldn't embellish stories, but that's pretty standard practice for a comedian. I'd go as far as to say he was pretty loved given his public TV appearances. He got in contact with Joe Rogan and through his podcast exposed himself to a wider audience. His storytelling would raise his stock through each JRE appearance. But there seems to be some stories where it's like, wait, huh? Like how he claims he's seen three people get struck by lightning, which is a bit dubious as only 270 people in a country of over 330 <laughs> million. I didn't know these people actually, uh, I didn't honest, honestly, like, let me say this to you guys right now. I honestly do think most of these comedians do lie about what they say, but I think there are a big portion of them who also tell the truth, but they may be embellished. Maybe that is still technically lying, but I think there is a still a nugget of truth contained in whatever story they tell. When it comes to the likes of Bobby Lee, I think Bobby Lee is basically trying to his best, which makes sense to save his career. If I was Bobby Lee and I was in a position that, I, that, that he was in, I would also be telling everybody that all the stories that I said were fake and made up. If that means that was how to save my career, because it might mean my fans or a small portion of my fans might not like me anymore and they might get turned off. But in the wider scheme of things, I would probably be okay with that. Like making sure that I kind of go back and say, hey, everything I said to you before was a lie and whatnot. But I think what Bobby Lee used to say in the past was true because guess what? In the early days of stand-up comedy podcasts, they all, they loved to go on there and talk about the most crazy outlandish stuff that happened to them because it was kind of an unregulated, kind of overlooked niche type of scene. So there was no reason to lie back then because actually the, the, the funnier and the realer the story, the actually better you would do. So the fact that Bobby Lee's coming out here saying that he lied previously about his previous stories now, I don't believe him. He definitely told the truth. He's just trying to save his career. Now, I'm not sitting there writing down all the stories these guys tell and thinking which one is real, which one is not real. I'm just listening to the story as part of the overall context of the podcast. But I don't ever walk away from it thinking, yeah, all the stories are true. Like as much as I love Joey Diaz, I know for sure 90%, if not 80% of his stories are probably made up. But the stories that he makes up kind of contribute to the overall point he wants to make. So it doesn't really matter to me. and It's kind of harmless. And if anything, I don't remember them anyway after I listened to the podcast. I don't actually sit there and think, oh, fucking hell, what, how crazy it was it when he did that, when he did I don't really think about it that deep. But it's pretty hilarious to see that we've got to this point in stand-up comedy podcasting commentary where there are people who legitimately are noting down what these comedians are saying and saying, hmm, press X for doubt on that one. That was probably true. That's not true. That was probably true. It's hilarious because you're now kind of like putting them under pressure to tell the truth. So I want to see how these guys react now because these guys are paying attention because I don't pay attention that deeply. But certainly these guys are. And it's fucking funny. I want to see what happens as a reaction. Do they double down and lie or do they tell the truth? Find out next time on Dragon Ball Z million are struck by lightning each year. If somebody wants to do the math and find the chances on that, let me know. It's frustrating because some of his stories are true, although heavily exaggerated, which one could argue on stage is for comedic effect. But when Bert is swearing on his children that these are true, it makes you question them a bit. Is he exaggerating these stories to seem cool for comedic effect or both? The story he has about the kids with no tongues is clearly a lie, but at least it has some sort of punchline, intentional or not. 
Growing up, I knew two dudes without tongues. That's Florida for you. What? Two dudes without tongues. Tongueless <laughs> Brett and ha. How do they lose their tongues? They didn't never told me. So we can forgive it. But the lightning one doesn't even have a punchline. It's just like, wow, I guess you've seen some crazy shit is the point of it. Now it's important to understand the distinction here. There are some comedians who make up or exaggerate stories who are very <laughs> funny, like Theo Vaughn. But yes. with him, the punchline is never, look how awesome I am, or look how crazy my life is. It's more of a setup to something clever, which Burt's are almost always not. And also with Theo, they're also very self-deprecating. It's kind of made to illustrate, because I think his overall point is that we all, like, everybody's poor is every every no every poor people are just poor people and they have more in common than they have you know difference even though they're kind of you know skin color or what how they grew up is different but growing up poor growing up on like the rough side of town is the same for everybody it's like a universal sort of language and he tells them with these like crazy stories of these people who kind of live on the fringes of society and they're kind of funny but they're done to basically illustrate how weird it was where he grew up but it's never to like oh look how cool i was Look how much money I had, blah, blah, blah. It's always like, look how weird this world is that I work in. And look, and kind of like, it's a contrast of like, I live in this weird, made up LA world. And I've also had this weird, you know, upbringing living in the South with these kind of freaky people that wear wooden t shirts. I think that kind of is a good way of doing it. But I also just think he's just a genuinely funny person anyway. So it probably helps. There's Theo Vaughn lies to make things funny, and there's Brendan Schaub lies to make yourself look cool. A crazy story becomes less funny when you realize it's not true. Bert tells his stories all the time on Joe Rogan, who is either very trusting or gullible depending on who you ask. Joe seems to believe all of Bert's stories no matter how crazy they are. And it's out of the question that Joe gave a platform for Bert to spew his, at best, embellished tales and at worst, bullshit stories. The funny thing about Joe as well, Joe also is a stickler. He always will double down. No, he'll always fucking drill in and quiz people on their facts if he doesn't like what they have to say. But if he likes what they have to say, you let them say what they want. That's this quintessential thing he does. If he, if, like, he does it constantly. If he brings on people who are kind of, you know, what you describe as right, right wing grifters, they don't get just as much as flipping same stick as other people do get in terms of, you know, maybe we'll just basically prove what they said was correct or not, provide evidence, provide proof or whatever it may be. It's absolutely quite funny to be fair. And obviously the fact of like the jokes going over his head. I love that part about him. Like he just refuses to laugh with certain people. Only certain people are allowed to joke on his podcast. Most of the time you have to go in there and be serious. Bert once claimed that he was in a college band with Mark Tremonte of Creed and fired him because he was too good. Knowing the story was BS, Bert said if you asked Mark, he would deny it. Mark didn't really deny it, but just acted confused when confronted about it. You're in a band, you ever have someone so good, you're like, oh, he's going to realize how bad I am. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I kicked him out. And <laughs> he was like, I'm the best guy in the band. And I was like, yeah, and that's why we don't want him anymore. He started a band called Creed. Ah. Oh no way, Mark! Mark Tremonti, yeah. No way! Yeah. Wow. And he and by the way, if you ask him about it, he'll deny it. He goes, "I don't know, Bert Kreischer," and I think he still holds like a, like a bone with it. Wow! You know, this, this has been going around for years. I I no, I wasn't in a band. <laughs> 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 I, I, he he said, uh, "I've read the story where I guess we were in a band together." And, he said um, he kicked you out. He kicked me out. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd remember that. <laughs> I was only in. I've only been in a handful of bands in my entire life. And honestly, what a weird lie to make up if that's a lie. Because from what I understand of, again, I'm a little bit of a music head myself. And I listen to a lot of interviews with bands that I like. And usually a lot of interviews that you listen to with bands, along the way, an interviewer would ask a question of like, can you talk about some bands that you in previously when you were younger? And it's usually quite a funny um, it's usually quite a good kind of icebreaker in a conversation of an interview um, or a topic to bring up because band members or band, you know, in general, people would like to talk about bands that are in there in high school, like crappy ones. I was in a pop punk band. I was in a rap group. I was in a boy band, whatever. People like talking about it, even if it ended terribly. So there's no reason for somebody like Mike, who's now a successful flipping musician in his own regard, to now years later be holding onto the grudge that some drunk guy in high school kicked him out of a shitty garage band. There's no reason to lie about that unless he's legitimately psychotic. It should be a nice story to kind of say, yeah, you know what? 
that is true. I remember Bert, blah, blah, blah. So him lying about something like that is absolutely batshit insane. He said he kicked you out and you turned around and said, you know what, I'll start a better band. And that's where Creed came from. I think he's trying to I think he's trying to take some credit for your success. Yeah. This video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN. Skip devices. Skip. I deal you. Plus, take advantage of limited time into it. He saw off a story about the time Bert robbed the train with the Russian mafia. The long story shirt is in high school, Bert went to Russia, met a bunch of Russian gangsters. Wow. So you guys, are there, honestly, let me see in the stream chat. Are there people out there that don't believe the Russian uh, mafia story? Sorry, the, um, uh, the machine story. I've always, be I've believed an element of it, but I'd never believed it's a made up lie. People don't believe it at all. I didn't know that was a thing. I actually believe that story because he's told it so often. I think if you've, if he's lying, he knows what happened to Steve, that Steve Renazizi guy who said he was in the fucking Twin Towers or around it when 9-11 happened. You know, eventually that lie will catch up with you. So I think if the story wasn't true, he would have probably fessed up by now. But I think there's elements of the story are true. Like he definitely went to Russia. He definitely maybe he didn't get kidnapped. Maybe he got, you know, told he couldn't leave a room that he was in or something like that. But wow, people don't believe it. Okay, everyone in the stream chat is saying no. I don't believe a word of it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. It's a lie. What would compel anyone to believe that? But oh my god, okay, I'm the I'm the gullible one, I guess. I actually believe the flipping machine story. Honestly, I believed it. I thought it was somewhat accurate, if that makes sense. Well, okay, cool. Anyway, let's continue with this guy's roundup. Let's actually skip to the first. So he starts. So he starts it from the beginning again. back into it however Bert's most famous story is the machine which happens to be his nickname based off a story about the time Bert robbed the train with the Russian mafia the long story shirt is in high school Bert went to Russia met a bunch of Russian gangsters accidentally introduced himself as the machine and acted as a sort of dancing monkey court jester for them of course the story ends with Bert becoming buddies with the criminals <laughs> and getting introduced to rival criminals as the machine I understand you're the machine as you know, Russian gangsters are famous for their hospitality and sense of humor. Exactly. The weird part about this story is some aspects of it seem to be true, but with Bert's embellishing in the past, it's impossible to tell which parts are real and which parts are figments of his imagination. Some of it is backed up, some of it not. Either way, this story became mega famous, leading to Bert naming his next special after- Fucking hell, mate, honestly. Bless that guy in it, but I honestly don't think I could ever be. It's bad enough walking around like that with a belly like that on the beach, but it's the beach, so you gotta take off your clothes. Fuck it. And I feel like sometimes if you're bigger and you you keep your clothes on, you actually look way more insecure than you would if you just took off your shirt. No one really gives a fuck. But walking around on stage with a belly like that, that's just full of beer, and looking the way that he does, that takes a lot of self confidence or just being paid a lot of money. Because I also think to myself like, if Bert was on like if Bert was still doing shitty comedy clubs and not getting comedy and not getting specials on Netflix, would he do this? Would he still be taking off his shirt? Because it kind of pays well. Like he's now being paid to look the way he looks. So there's no reason to work out or get fit because essentially he's become a multimillionaire because of his kind of, you know, functioning alcoholic lifestyle. So this kind of makes it easy to do. Cause I wonder, like I said, if, if he was coming up and he was doing like, you know, comedy sellers and shit on a daily and struggling to sell out 200 cap venues would he still be taking off his t-shirt every night probably not probably makes it easy to take it off because you know you're gonna get paid a fat wedge at the end of the night to the story and they're even making a fucking movie about it so Bert's star is certainly shining bright at this moment yep. and he knew it Bert started becoming a Hollywood elite at least in his eyes while still having to live up to his frat boy drunken persona but at this point he's 50 years old and oh he's 50 still having to live up to his frat boy drunken persona but at this Bert Crash is 50 years old I had no idea he was that old Holy shit. Tom Segura is 40. So Tom Segura is nearly 10 years younger than him. No way is that true. No way. No fucking way. Let me Google that. Tom Segura age. He is. Tom Segura is 43 years old. 
Nearly 44. Burst older than him and acts the way he acts. Nah, that's a that that to me is golden handcuffs for me. That's golden handcuffs. The fact that Bert has to live this like adult frat, not even adult, near on granddad frat frat boy persona thing, that is golden handcuffs for me. He is that is like a life of misery. That's actually that's that's really depressing. I'm not gonna lie. I kind of feel bad for the guy, even though he's rich and famous and stuff. The fact that he has to live this life where he basically can't get fit. He's stuck in this box where he basically has to be morbidly obese and be an alcoholic and have skin that looks like a fucking Savaloy. But he's but he's uh, 50 years old. is crazy. Crazy. He's stuck in that fucking never grow up arrested development stage and he's 50 years old. He talks about drinking box wine on a treadmill, not showering, not wiping his ass properly, shit in his pants, all this shit. And he's 50 years old. Honestly, there's the only thing I think, for the most part, I think the only thing I legitimately think is kind of um, enviable about some of these comedians is that they get to live a life on their terms. They get to wake up, record a podcast when they want for the most part. They have sponsors coming out of their ass. Fans that love to see them play in their, in their, in their city, regardless of how repetitive the flipping material is, like a Bobby Lee, they don't write new shit or whatever. They still watch their stuff. They still buy tickets. They buy merch. They hang out. You get to live life on your own terms. But outside of that, being a comedian seems a little bit depressing, especially at this level. It seems a little bit pathetic, it seems a little bit sad, and it seems like the opposite of cool. Because I can't think of anything less, I can't think of anything more uncool than being a 50 year old man who has to like drink on stage, take shots with your flipping fans and shit, and take a t shirt off every night. I can't think of anything more uncool than that, in my personal opinion. That's the t antithesis of being uncool. Or basically, you know, making it seem like you went to the fucking, that you served in the military because you ran a couple of half marathons, because you got into a cold shower, right? Because you, you eat fucking chicken or meat every day. That kind of shit is kind of lame. The lifestyle is pretty cool, but everything else out of it is kind of lame. The fact that you, you're on road all the time and you don't get to raise your kids, you don't get to hang out with your partner, you kind of live this kind of weird quasi bachelor life, yet you've got a partner at home. Like you don't see your kids growing up. Um, it's all about you. You're super self-absorbed. You don't really have any real friends because everybody's kind of leeching off you to get a set, to be booked on a show so they can become famous. It seems a little bit sad and depressing outside of the lifestyle, of course, driving the fast cars, jumping on the private jets if you like that sort of shit. But honestly, I would be so depressed if I had to be on stage drinking and taking shots with fans and shit, doing body shots, playing beer pong at 50 years old. Point he's 50 years old. At what point does it go from stupid, funny, drunk guy to alcoholic? Yeah, Bert doesn't seem to think it's at that point, though. Despite showing clear signs of alcohol dependency or, you know, being an alcoholic, Bert is in complete <laughs> denial about his problem. Do you think that you're an alcoholic? No. Being powerless to alcohol is different than drinking a lot. I drank a lot yesterday and I woke up in the middle of the night in a fucking sizzle. I mean, but isn't that, isn't that okay though? Again, I don't like it and I think he's, he's, he's kind of hard to watch. You have to take him in small doses. But isn't that like, as bad as it is, because he's been given the gift, he's been given an amazing opportunity to do, you know, do what he wants in life and make a lot of money and make people happy and smile and shit. He should maybe, you know, take it a little bit seriously and maybe stop doing the drinking or time source thing. But surely, if you just enjoy drinking a lot, is there is there such a thing as enjoying drinking a lot and not being an alcoholic? That's what I'm trying to say. It does that exist? I'm sure it does. Because I think to be what's the definition of being a what's the definition of an alcoholic? Um Defi Actually let's get up on the screen. What am I doing here? Uh, let's get up on the screen. Um, definition of alcoholic. Uh, what is yeah? What is the what is defined as alcoholic? Uh, a chronic disease in which the person um craves drinks that contain alcohol and is unable to control his or her drinking a person who disease also needs to drink greater amounts to get the same effect and withdraw symptoms after stopping using alcohol oh. okay that kind of describes Bert. <laughs> that kind of describes Bert. but 
can you that's my question in the chat for you guys in the chat can you drink a lot without being alcoholic like you know how people just love to drink fizzy drinks would you say they're addicted to fizzy drinks or they just enjoy the sugary delights of a coca-cola or something is that possible please tell me in the chat is that possible you just like to have a drink but you're not like itching like you're not like a you're not like a you're not like a you know a bum on the street like drinking really cheap because when i think of alcoholic i think of somebody that drinks anything to get a buzz like crappy stuff energy drinks and stuff like anything but i don't know if you just love if you just enjoy a cocktail every night at the end of work it does that actually make you an alcoholic that you enjoy a cocktail at the end of every work day it just means that's the way you like to kind of you know cap out a work day because if that's the case then i must know a lot of people who are addicted to weed because people smoke weed every day maybe more so than they drink sometimes so does that mean you're addicted to alcohol to to weed what are you saying here no that's not alcoholic that's not an alcoholic as what this is not alcoholic. this this definition eventually your body will get hooked i think there's levels of alcoholism okay levels of alcoholism you're an alcoholic if you go through withdrawal when you stop um, abruptly and you continue to use oh okay cool but to be fair uche i do remember Bert Crash is saying sometimes that he got the shakes and shit from not drinking or whatever. I do remember that being a thing that he talks about, like getting the shakes. So maybe he is an alcoholic. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Okay, here we go. Three types. Um, what, okay, look, let's see here. What are the three types? Let's just go to this page. Let's see. There's three types of alcoholism. I want to see this through. Um, three types, right? The three types of alcoholism. Um, the only type of alcohol that humans can safely drink is ethanol. We use the two other types of alcohol for cleaning and manufacturing, not for making drinks. For example, methanol or methylene alcohol is a component in fuel for cars and boats. It's also used to manufacture antifreeze, paint remover, windshield, um, wiper fluid, and many other products. Isopropanol and isopropylene, uh, isopropylene sorry, alcohol is a chemical name for rubbing alcohol for cleaning. Da -da -da, ethanol, da -da -da, ethanol, okay, da -da. okay, it's not the same thing. I don't need, it doesn't mean, hey, it doesn't fucking matter. Who cares? Um, let's go back to the fucking video. But Jesus Christ, but Christ, Jesus Christos, where is he? There you go. Let's go back to the video. You know, so hot, and all of a sudden my body went <laughs> and fucking poured sweat. Wow. Back to sleep. When people are telling him, hey, you're unhealthy, Bert's quickly on the defensive. This may be because of Bert's new status, which makes him think he's above everybody else. Him and co-host of the Two Bears One Cave podcast, Tom. No, I don't think that's 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 fair. He doesn't think he's above anybody. He's just in denial. And I think that's perfectly understandable. Who would want to admit to themselves that they're a 50-year-old alcoholic? You know what I mean? Functioning alcoholic. And it's even worse now because he makes a lot of money and he's super successful. So he can le legitimately create... I think he mentioned in the Tim Dillon podcast, he said he could basically live a life that he wants to live. Well, I think he might mention it with a recent one, Eliza Schlesinger. He's got an episode with Eliza Schlesinger, which I'm surprised they're friends, actually. I wouldn't think Burt Kreischer and Eliza Schlesinger would be friends because she, she doesn't seem like she's easy to get along with. But they were friends anyway, and um, they're talking on a pod, and he mentions that he likes his lifestyle because he gets to basically create his own he can basically do what he wants in a basically roundabout you know way of saying things um and i think if that's the case then being somewhat in denial about your alcoholism makes sense because you don't have to admit you know that your lifestyle you're living now is somewhat you know n not healthy destructive all that's malarkey so i kind of get why he's being defensive about it to be honest it makes sense Segura received some pretty significant backlash from their audience after they constantly talked about how rich they are, their lifestyles, how they rode private jets, etc. To which they responded, oh so classily. <laughs> Every time we talk about like a walk. Epic rant. This was the best rant ever. This was an epic rant because for me, I think I mentioned at the time, it was a legit mask off moment. And I think most comedians feel this way about their fans. I said it before on the flipping podcast i think most comedians especially especially when you see how they react to reddit they kind of treat reddit like it's fucking 4chan or something it's not that deep it's just a bunch of people on there some of them are your fans some of them aren't your fans but they're poking fun at you because you guys poke fun at everything else and you're meant to be guess what stand-up comedian so you should be able to take a little bit of ribbing a little bit of flipping teasing once in a while a little bit of trolling but they get so defensive so emotional so butthurt about people saying anything slightly negative about what they have to say it makes me believe 
that if somebody today, I don't think anyone will because who would do that because of a complete waste of time. But if somebody was to start today a channel where they critiqued comedy specials, it might already exist actually. And I bet it doesn't get many views because people really don't care about that shit. They want you just to insult people. But if somebody started a comedy channel where they just critiqued and broke down comedy specials and said why this special sucks, why it's good, you know, critique the production, the lighting, the sound, what the person wore, the material, whatever it may be. I bet you these comics will still have an issue with it. They will still cry. Even though that person is going to be pretty um, fair, right? They're going to be pretty objective and they're going to critique it like an actual art critic would critique a movie or a TV series. They would still find a way to be butthurt about it because fundamentally, all of these stand-up comedians, they just want you to fucking consume what they do view what they do click what they do buy their merch click the ads or whatever it may be come to their shows and that's it all they want you to do is to flipping consume what they put out don't offer suggestions don't offer insight i dare you to fucking message one of these comedians to get a reply most of them will leave you on red they won't even open your messages like they don't even look at their comments they don't even heart their comments no replies nothing they just give you the content you give them all the monies all the attention and that's it and you make them rich and famous and then they start shitting on you and start talking about private jets and big cars and shit. It's crazy. But I think everybody thinks like this, but Tom was the only one brave enough to come out and actually say it. Watch or a car. I'll get this, uh, like a, a bunch of messages from losers that, that try to tell me that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm making them feel <laughs> bad about their situation. Oh, but... I, I'm struggling with rent this month. Figure it the fuck out, okay? <laughs> like, don't make my life be a problem for your life. To illustrate this, look at Bert when he realizes some random kid doesn't know who he is. He loves the celebrity, he loves the status, and he loves being the most likable person in the room, even if that is a part of his delusions. Bert seemingly must have realized that he's not witty enough to be a stand-up comedian, or he just didn't like doing it, so he decided to dive into the new age and attempt to go viral. After some failed vlog attempts, Bert had a couple of clips of him laughing go viral and pop off. These clips seemingly came more and more as they found success, with Bert even admitting so himself. The way you guys hunt, the way you guys fish, I do that for laughs. Yes. I sit with my bait in the water waiting for a laugh. Waiting for a laugh, and, and I don't want to create it. Many have speculated this laugh to be completely fake and cringe. That sentence, cringe. Honestly, I'd have to agree. Look how quickly he switches up here. <laughs> oh, oh, you have one of the best Asian jokes ever that I heard 17 years ago. <sighs> you know, it's fake, right? Because of how he's able to like say a sentence, like a coherent sentence, like. He's actually thinking about what he's saying and then he's saying it through his laughter. Usually, if you're laughing like that, it doesn't work like that. You know? It doesn't work like that. It really doesn't work like that. Nah. I think he's... I've, my, my theory is, I think the laugh is real. Like the, e -e -e, the whistling, he he he, whatever that fucking shit he does. But obviously, he can kind of put... Like, with most of our... With, with our own laughs... You can basically laugh on cue if you want to. So I think the laugh, actually, the style of the laugh is real, if that makes sense. Laugh style, big up DSP. That is legit, but he can laugh on cue, on command, sorry, at this point. He can just turn it on like a porn star faking orgasms. Uh, uh, eh. uh, he can basically do the same thing. That's what he basically is. He's not a hunter. He's a porn star for life, for laughs. That's what he is. He is a adult entertainment star for laughs that's what he is actually he is the naughty america of stand-up comedians right that's what he is naughty america <laughs> oh yeah in the intro they've got a laugh there also that's what he does imagine somebody used to do that somebody used to create a naughty america intro and replace that little giggle with the girl with his laugh that would definitely take your boner away <laughs> Wait, you really are Korean? This combined with his inflated ego have led to a huge chunk of people starting to dislike him a bit, including Adam Sandler, where Bert embarrassed himself in front of oh, the Sandman. It seems like brutal. Bert is always trying so hard to be the coolest guy, the most likable guy, the funniest guy in the room. 
And while it's not at Brendan Schaub levels, it's dang close. He's seemingly worn thin with mainstream Hollywood, so he sticks to his place where he can feel like an elite. The infested swamp that is the LA podcast scene. Uh -huh. His lies or stretching of the truth, him being in denial about his health, his drunkenness, his lack of self-awareness, and just general persona, all of that is completely unchecked now. But you know what? Oddly enough, awareness sorry. and just general persona, all of that is you know what's really funny about this? All of these things are like the, these. Th this is also the checklist that you need to be successful. To be successful in the, as an LA stand-up, especially in that scene, especially in, just in LA overall, forget stand-up comedy, just say in LA overall, doesn't matter if you're an influencer, fitness influencer, comedian, podcast or whatever, to be successful over there, you basically need to check off these checklists in one way, shape or form. Lies overall, Denials about your health or your looks, some sort of vice, whether it's gambling, drunkenness, drinking, fucking, kitty diddling if you're Chris D'Elia, something, right? A vice. Lack of self-awareness, also something I've spoken about already. That delusion, you have to have it in you. And just a general personality that is kind of Marmite. It's sort of like 50-50. You got people that like you and, and don't like you. You kind of need that. If you have sort of like ambivalence or whatever it may be, then maybe you're not going to make it. But if you have these five, then it's definitely, you're on your way. This is kind of a checklist to be successful. Weird enough. To be successful, have these and you're going to win. It's completely unchecked now. Bert is slowly losing the audience that once loved him so much. These people followed him because he was being himself. Heck, that's why he got famous in the first place. Now he's stuck. He's not in his 20s anymore. Being a drunk can be kind of funny at 21, less funny at 50. Yep. He's also clearly not authentic, as many people would claim he used to be, with his clips attempting to go viral. The only thing worse than him forcing this laugh for clicks is Brendan Schaub joining him on it. And trust me, if the machine movie sucks, which is a very real possibility, I might add. I don't think so. I think it's going to do really well, by the way. I'm going on a record. I think the machine's movie is going to do really surprisingly well. And it's going to make Bert an even bigger star than he is. And it's going to make him even more insufferable and obnoxious than he already is. So if you already not if you already dislike Burt Kreischer, please put on your seatbelt. It's gonna get really bad. Burt might lose his audience in a more rapid rate than he is now. I mean, why do people even watch Burt Kreischer anymore? People have probably all heard the machine story, all of his tales from being a college frat guy who everyone loved. I mean, what's the point anymore? He's a 50 year old guy with kids who actively gets drunk and lies about having a drug problem. He's also starting to epitomize the worst parts of Hollywood, minus the obvious. Fakeness, a superiority <laughs> complex, and zero self-awareness. A comic's brain is so different than a, than a pedestrian's brain. <laughs> and like what, you know, like, I can't help. I went pedestrian to a, is so funny, by the way. Uh, <laughs> like saying that, that, that. That drives me crazy. It's like, we're not in the fucking armed force. Let's Big up Stabby Baby, man. What an absolute G. I love this moment so much. Because Bert at one moment thought he met. Bert honestly legitimately thought he meant he agreed with what he said. Like, yeah, man, predations just don't get us. Civilians just don't understand what it's like to be a 50-year-old alcoholic. And he was like, just relax. We tell dick jokes on stage. Le like, we're legitimately court gestures. We're at the bottom rungs of society. Comedians are probably just above flipping DJs, if not just underneath us. We're not that important, but that's the thing as well you think, when, especially when I've seen in my life. Like, DJs and comedians, the egos that they have, despite doing jobs that basically anybody can do. A DJ, have decent taste in music, or good taste in music. Um, ha have the technical ability to mix one record into the other. And nowadays, if you with good equipment, you don't need to do that. You've got good sync buttons. But essentially, if you have good, decent taste in music, a decent persona, and you work hard enough, you could make it. But it's not like you're flipping in a band playing a fucking instrument or writing your own songs. You're playing other songs other people make really loudly in clubs. But some of these guys legitimately walk around like they're fucking David Bowie in this shit. It's really embarrassing. Same thing goes for some of these comedians. You tell dick jokes on stage and you think you're fucking modern day philosophers, as Swippin' Brendan would say. You're not. You're blogbuzzer.
Let's fucking react. Relax. Of, yeah. Any person on the street, I respect more than even my favorite comic. Yay. And with that note, I want to leave you with one of the most bullshit Burt Kreischer stories I've ever heard. Whereas some stories you could argue maybe happen to some extent, this one, there's no fucking chance. I'm sorry. As a Canadian, I will say there is no fucking chance that this happened. And okay. you'll see what I, I mean. I can't wait. I can't when we wait. went to Canada for the first time, you're not allowed to bring drugs into Canada, obviously. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Drugs in Canada? I brought a little bit of drugs into Canada. What'd you bring? Okay. Just weed, a one hitter. I brought a glass one hitter. Where was it? What's that mean? Uh, it was. A what is a glass one hitter of weed, by the way? What does that mean? Because we get. The weed we get in the UK is horrible. It's usually stuck between somebody's ball sack and the side of their leg. So it's not the greatest. And it usually comes in like Ziploc bags. But what does what does a weed hit? What's that called? A weed hit? What the fuck is a weed hit in glass? What the fuck is that? Is that like a, a glass? Can, what does that mean? A weed hit in glass? Oh, is it like a, a glass pipe? It looks like a crack, a crack pipe. Is that what it is? Is that what it, that, that he had? Like a glass crack pipe thing? Literally. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah. So it's this. Is that is it is, is it this? Let me see. Let me get it. I got up on my phone. Is this is this correct? That thing is that is that the one? That's the that's a weed hit, yeah. That he brought that to. Even I don't believe him. I'm not from the the states, or I'm not from North America, but I know how flipping crazy the border patrol is over there in flipping Canada and shit. There's no way he took that. He was able to take that over the border. No way. No way. But let's see what he says. I had it with me because it was the first time on a tour bus. Did they have a dog? No, we. So I said, "What I'm gonna do?" I'll, Leanne was with me, so it was Jesus Trejo, and I said, "I'm gonna." It's my first time on a tour bus. I'm gonna have a cocktail. I'm gonna smoke this one hitter. I'm gonna enjoy the tour bus. All of a sudden, the doors open and they're like, "We're at Borders," and I hadn't hit my one hitter, so I fucking panicked. I run back to the bathroom. It's a brand new tour bus. I've never been on a tour bus. I don't have you know how lights work. I don't know how anything works. I just know I gotta clean out this one hitter. You gotta so, clean it out by smoking weed while you're at the border. I gotta, I gotta empty it and throw it in the garbage. I gotta right. get rid of it. I gotta flush it. Right. Drop the glass one hitter. It shatters. Okay. I scramble. I can't figure out how to get the lights on. I get the weed. I put it in the toilet. I fucking, I, literally, doors are opening, and they're like, "Hey, border patrol, we're here to search the bus." I was like, "Oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure." The one thing Leanne said was, "Do not bring drugs into fucking Canada." So we go into the holding thing and we're there for like an hour and a half at two in the fucking morning. An hour and a half we're waiting and I'm like, I'm fucking busted. And the guy comes in and he goes, uh, you guys are all good. And I was like, oh, thank God. So as we're walking to the bus, I'm still a little buzzed and I'm feeling loose. And I go, hey man, just out of curiosity, like what would have happened if we had brought drugs in, in, into the into Canada and he goes you mean hypothetically like say someone had a glass one hitter in their bathroom shattered it tried to throw it in the toilet and didn't flush it and immediately everyone looks at me and I'm like yeah like that and he go I'd say it's an honor meeting the machine enjoy your tour in Canada <laughs> oh, come on Bert come on Bert come on man come on come on bro come on man that can't be true. Come on. That's impossible. No, hold on. It's not impossible, but it just seems too good to be true. It's like the it's like the Brendan Shaw casual lie, he says. When Brendan's like Brendan will sometimes say, Oh, I was out and about and this guy, I don't know, it would be like a busboy at a flipping hotel. Or like somebody at the concierge. Or like a valet person. And they always recognize him. Or like a person at the coffee shop. Oh, it's, oh, Brendan, what's up? And they start engaging in some conversation. Maybe give him some information or annoy him. But there's always somebody that recognizes him. Everywhere he goes. Don't get me wrong. I don't live in America. I don't live in LA. I'm sure Brendan does get recognized somewhat over there. Because he's been there a while. He's obviously somewhat famous in his, in his, in his core area. Niche, whatever it may be. But to think that everywhere he goes, everybody recognizes him is legitimately insane. Like, he's not that famous. They think they're that famous, but they're not that famous overall. And I also don't think that fame would have any kind of influence in these scenarios either. Not in that way, personally. So I think there's maybe an element of the story that's true, but overall, this like, and the crowd cheered, end of the story. Because that's what all these stories are like. 
he never really has to, for some reason, these stories, he never has to suffer any real life consequences. He always kind of gets away with it. But I love his language also at the end, because I think it kind of made reminded me of why I think some people got a little bit concerned. I think when I made the post or I made the clip of when I said, oh, I'm going to go on my Burkheim six weeks sobriety thing, which I'm still on, obviously, and obviously smashing it and loving life. I remember, I think I said something along the lines of, oh, um, I like a little reward where I kind of like, if I'm, if I behave myself like for like six weeks or do a good Monday to Friday, and if I want to go outside, I can go out and get crazy and whatnot, right? And I think the way that I see it in my head, it's not like a, it's not like a, a reward, like eating a chocolate bar. It's just my way of having balance because I don't really believe in like now in my life, in my life that I want to be, you know, sober all the way through until the end. I kind of want to have balance, but I want to be mostly not mostly sober most of the time and when i want to get crazy i want to get crazy but now but beforehand i had a little bit too much overlap on the getting crazy side so the days of me being sober weren't there so that i couldn't do the things i want to do because i you know i want to work hard i want to get to where i want to get to and whatnot so i want to have that balance so when i use the term reward it's more so okay you know have these long extended periods of time where you don't do shit for six months and if you want to go crazy for a weekend go and then go back to being you know sober for the next six months cool but I love with Bert, he has this words he uses all the time. I think he uses phrases or words like treats and rewards and stuff and gifts and treat myself. And he's a 50-year-old man. I wonder what that is about, that kind of psychology of using those terms. Because I think with me, there maybe is an element of cope in there and maybe an element of like trying to trick myself that I'm doing well by going to gym and stuff. I, I know maybe there is in it. But at least I'm doing the work in some respect. I am trying to live a somewhat, you know, straight edge, kind of like straight laced life Monday to Friday. And if I want to get crazy on the weekend, I do it. I'm doing that kind of balance. With this guy, his entire life is indulging himself. He does what he wants all the time. So the idea of a reward and a treat doesn't hit the same as a regular schmegular person. Because he has no, his life, someone just said balance. There is no balance in his life ever. So why is he bothered? So why is he so concerned about having treats and shit? Maybe that's the addict side of him in that regard. He always feels like he has to kind of give himself a treat. And maybe the treat is his addictions. The beer, the water, the malarkey in this regard. You just have to say, it's probably thankful that he's not into class A drugs. He doesn't strike me as somebody that would do coke, that would do pills, or maybe he did something, but that would do like crazy stuff like heroin, lean, you know, whatever it may be, he'd maybe smoke a bit of weed here and there, but he's kind of lucky that that is not the case because with his pace and with his indul- with his kind of proclivity to indulge himself, it would be flipping spooky for him, really would. So it's kind of fortunate that all he likes to do is drink. And I know drink is still bad for you and it can cause a slow death, but at least it's booze. At least it isn't anything too crazy. But for sure, that last story at the end, nah, definitely, definitely not true. What we say? Oh, you just said no. Um, he loved. He talked about doing loving coke on a podcast in New York. I think it was he. We might be drunk. Oh, really? Okay, interesting. Okay, interesting that he would admit that. Okay, that that might change for him because I think if he did involve drugs, actual drugs, in into his lifestyle, he would be fucked. Like with a capital F, F U K E D, spelling it the flipping Brendan Shawboy. He'd be so fucked. Or F U G G E D. Like if he legitimately enjoyed Coke. Like actually. Like he'd be so messed up, I swear to God. Um, but yeah. Big up him regardless, big up him. 